Disease, uh, disaster, diaspora, uh, Latin American Caribbean studies, uh, environmental literature, and social media. In fact, we've done some work in the past on, on neutral interests in media. I'm really happy to uh, see who he's going to talk to us about today. He does photography, he writes fiction, uh, poetry, and blogs about public discourse and multiculturalism at the culture and about disaster. Katie and Katrina at Three Sons, and he has degrees in history, literature, communication, and business from Harvard, Stanford, UCLA, and Real Renaissance Man. <laughs> uh, so today, he's going to be speaking on narratives of race, humanitarianism, and self-help in post-earthquake Haiti. Russell? Thank you, everybody, for being here. And uh, to be able to start a discussion more than come up with the uh, Final conclusions here. So need no signal. I'm on sabbatical, so I'm supposed to be doing all kinds of wonderful research and so on. <laughs> and uh, what I did for the first uh, almost month of my sabbatical, um, I went went to Haiti. Uh, I had not I've been all over the Caribbean pretty mm -hmm. much, so not been on an island in Hispaniola. And uh, one of the things I study is disaster, and I've uh, uh, experienced as a family member, along with uh, my wife, uh, Dr. Tucker, uh, our father and father-in-law missing for uh, a week following Katrina. Mm -hmm. And uh, believe it or not, I studied disaster before that, but that made me a real serious student mm -hmm. over after that. And uh, so I'm, I'm basically combining uh, interest in, in uh, disaster, interest in the Caribbean and Latin America uh, with the uh, awful uh, events uh, a little more than a year ago, uh, January 12, uh, 2010. So uh, there are parallels between uh, Katrina and um, and the earthquake. The earthquakes don't have names. I guess they should have started thinking about uh, <laughs> changing that, uh, making making so you know uh, what you're dealing with. Um, but uh, uh, and I would be happy to uh, to uh, do some comparative uh, kind of uh, discussion with you on the uh, two things. As a matter of fact, I am trying to make a uh, a kind of a comparison. Uh, not so much with the disasters themselves of Katrina and uh, the January 12th earthquake, but also uh, the kind of uh, neoliberal uh, political economy that operates and operated and continues to operate uh, before both of these disasters happen and uh, uh, right now uh, in terms of the recovery uh, of the people in both the Gulf Coast and uh, in, in Haiti. There's also, of course, a link between, a direct link between uh, Haiti and New Orleans. As a matter of fact, Port-au-Prince, uh, the capital of uh, Port-au-Prince, if I'm going to say it the right French pronunciation. But when I was there, I found that my French wasn't always, uh, was always uh, something that would help me with, uh, with Creole, which I don't say I'm an expert in my interest in that nation. But um, uh, Port-au-Prince and uh, uh, La Nouvelle-Orléans are sister cities, uh, actually. And uh, there was a... Um, uh, after the uh, revolution, which I'm going to talk a little bit about today, um, uh, in, in Haiti, uh, a number of um, Haitian uh, planters uh, brought their captives with them to New Orleans. So there was another influx of the culture that was already African-based culture that was uh, combined with uh, uh, French and uh, uh, Spanish and Cuban and uh, Native American. 
in, in uh, New Orleans. So, uh, so as a person that, that uh, at least finished high school and claims to be from New Orleans, uh, I've had an interest in, in Haiti, which I've never really uh, uh, had an occasion to follow up on until the earthquake. So I uh, said, said, said that that jolted me into uh, the action. Right? As I said, I've been all around Haiti, but I've never actually uh, been to Haiti, so here I am. Um, the uh, uh, other thing I, I want to uh, say is that I'm not, this has not been one of my long-term research areas, meaning Haiti itself. Uh, but uh, since the earthquake, it, it has uh, moved up on the uh, on the priority list. And you know, I, I, I like to do comparative kinds of uh, work, so uh, this is an opportunity to do some of the comparison. So let's go ahead here and a little bit. I've got some some video. So I'm calling this narratives of race, humanitarianism, and self-help in the Haiti. And this, uh, may I hear speak real? I speak French. I'm trying to make some, some sense out of part of it anyway. The, uh, the, the say uh, always throws me off because of, uh, of the reflection in Spanish and so on. So I was trying to learn Creole. I see that and kind of get frustrated. But anyway, basically it says that Haiti is a slippery country, a very slippery country. They're referring to the politics uh, in Haiti. But uh, you could uh, probably expand that beyond just the political dimension. And the reason I chose that quote um, is that um, I want to try to uh, you know, do that comparison I was talking about with the, uh, uh, some of the neoliberal uh, political economic issues uh, that are uh, operating in the Gulf Coast uh, and affecting that recovery, uh, but also just in the foreign country. And uh, how those might also be happening uh, in Haiti. So we'll come back to come back to that. And here's where I'm going to go today. Uh, this is a roadmap, literally, it's a roadmap of, of Haiti. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the conditions that uh, prevailed um, leading up to the earthquake, uh, the events themselves around the earthquake, the response, and how that response is affected by the uh, racial regimes and also the general. Uh, opportunity structures and possibilities for the development of Haiti are affected by uh, racial regimes. And then I'll talk, I'll talk a little bit uh, about narratives and other kind of leadership of the results of ourselves. But uh, anyway, so let's let's go on. Uh, Porto, I don't have a pointer, but Port au Prince is kind of in that little uh, to the long peninsula, and um, it's right there in this nook here. It's covered up a little bit, but I'll walk up here. And uh, so I, I spent most of my time virtually all of my time here in uh, for that month that I was there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the conditions before the earthquake. Um, basically, uh, I don't need to read all of this stuff off, but you can um, uh, look at some of these figures and some of them I think you know about. You may not know that too many people uh, were living in the affected area, which is pretty much in and around uh, Port au uh, basically, it's become a cliche to talk about Haiti being the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. I'm going to come back to that much later uh, in, the, in the talk. And um, the uh, other, other big issue is uh, lack of education and, uh, uh, of course, uh, poor living conditions, uh, some of which, of course, contributed to, or many of which contributed to the loss of life and loss of limb uh, in the earthquake because uh, many buildings, not all of the many buildings in the earthquake are filled with uh, reinforced concrete, poorly reinforced concrete, and uh, given that no earthquake had really hit uh, that area for uh, the time between uh, 2010 and 1770, uh, and no, nobody, you know, people were kind of oriented toward uh, hurricanes, tropical storms, a lot of rain, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so a concrete house is really good for, for protecting this hurricane, but it doesn't really help you if it doesn't have, if you're not building the court and you can't coats, and there are no hurricane coats uh, in Haiti. Okay. Uh, this is a, a Haitian school, and uh, it's a little dark there, but if you can see where the light's coming from uh, above the kids there, mm -hmm. uh, that's a concrete wall. And uh, the rest of the the building is concrete. So you can imagine what 
would happen and what may have happened in that particular building. I don't know for sure, but um, when the earthquake did happen, uh, these are some of the consequences. Uh, and I, you know, I, I think 300,000 is probably a low number. That's that's a high number of estimates, but uh, I think more than 300,000 people uh, died in the earthquake, and many are still buried in the rubble. One of the big problems is uh, lack of removal of the rubble, and you can't, as someone said, referring to New Orleans, uh, you can't start building or rebuilding until you clean up to get the rubble out of it. And uh, a lot of the rubble is just being moved from place to place uh, by hand and not really being systematically taken out of the area so many people uh, who come in and, and start to, uh, to actually rebuild and to put people back in their neighborhoods. Um, you can see the number of homes that were damaged or destroyed and uh, nearly 5,000 schools that were damaged or destroyed. So basically have uh, people living in uh, uh, a huge number of, of uh, displaced person camps uh, a year after the earthquake, uh, having survived uh, heavy rainstorms and a near miss by a hurricane, Tomas, um, last November. Uh, I'm not even going to mention the cholera, the cholera epidemic, which has been confined, not confined, but started out in the uh, rural areas, but there have been some cases in the uh, as, as well. And some of the people who were in those rural areas were originally uh, residents of the, of the capital city and went out there because they felt the uh, living would be easier um, than they saw the road. All right, and this is a school that collapsed. Um, the world had see someone uh, risking his hand pointing there. Uh, it showed showing a little bit better on my, on my screen, but uh, uh, people went out immediately after the earthquake and were just digging people out with their bare hands, again, uh, because of the lack of uh, heavy earth movement equipment and so on, uh, you uh, had probably a number of people, a huge number of people who died that many, many have been sitting that they could have uh, had some energy going in there and move uh, all this rubble. All right, let's talk a little bit about it. This is after the earthquake. Uh, I mentioned the homelessness. Um, uh, 1.5 million camp dwellers, um, and many of those are and have been at risk for uh, flooding and uh, landslides uh, following heavy rains. Um, there are over um, uh, 1,100 camps, including 54 that hold 5,000 people or more. And I've been to one of the really big ones. Uh, it's called Karai Ceslas. And uh, that last part, Ceslas, looks a little bit like ceaseless in, uh, in, in, in English. Uh, the camp goes on and on and on the picture. In this PowerPoint, but uh, when I left uh, Port au Prince and flew over, uh, I guess we were flying uh, westward, uh, there was the camp which took probably almost 40 minutes to drive to uh, over bad roads, that kind of thing. And it just it, it sprawls forever. And it's out of open area, no trees. Uh, it's just desolate, and that's one of the, one of the big camps. Um, the, um, I mentioned the, uh, uh, the issue of rubble there. Uh, 19 million cubic meters of rubble uh, that resulted from the quake in uh, Port Prince, enough to fill a line of shipping containers stretching end to end from London to Beirut. I took this from an English website, that's why they used that. <laughs> <laughs> that particular distance, I, I measured it's about uh, 42 or 4,300 miles, and it's probably the same as from Port Prince up to Portland, Oregon. And I, I, or I think that's interesting because uh, the, the particular uh, terminus there in Oregon, because uh, one of the Haitians I met and uh, befriended um, is married to uh, a Sierra Leonean woman who works in, uh, uh, I think, exactly mental health, work with the development of the disabled. And he's in some small town in Oregon. So here's this Haitian guy uh, and this woman from Sierra Leone living in Let's Imagine what the, what, what, what the people uh, do in terms of dragging them and vice versa. I'm sure you know, she loves it. So that's where my is up there. So <laughs> Um, I tried to get them to come down for Thanksgiving. And, they were, they were down um, and it's a similar figure of, of, um, of, of uh, rubble, and it wasn't the same kind of rubble uh, with, with the train because a lot of, of the uh, 
material that ended up in front of people's houses uh, came from them gutting their houses. Uh, there were houses that had been flooded. Although there were houses that were knocked down, but uh, none of that was concrete rubble. It was mostly uh, wood and furniture and, and moldy rugs and that kind of thing, the wall coverings. So, so that's what we're looking at uh, at, at that time. Now, the uh, nature of the earthquake response is um, there was, of course, rapid international governmental and intergovernmental humanitarian relief. Uh, there were also a number of non governmental organizations. Uh, that were already there, Doctors Without Borders uh, uh, was already there, CARE, um, uh, of course, uh, some of the government organizations, USAID, Agency for International Development, um, and the list, I mean, there's thousands of NGOs uh, in Haiti, which is kind of one of the issues there. Uh, not so much just recovering from the uh, earthquake, but just in general. Uh, Haiti could be called a failed state. There basically is no functioning government. You can argue that there wasn't much of one before the earthquake, but uh, Parliament has been dissolved since the earthquake, and we'll talk a little more about that uh, as well. And then there's what I call public humanitarian assistance, and I think there's another term for that. But uh, Americans really did rise to the occasion, and people from other countries as well. Uh, they in their pockets, uh, they watched the telephones, um, they, they listened to celebrities, uh, including White like, Cliff. Like Jean, who um, did run for a while for president, but he was not uh, qualified uh, according to the election uh, uh, officials. Um, and he had one, the, the main disqualification was that he didn't live, he had lived in Haiti for five years uh, consecutively uh, before, uh, before the election. Um, so that's one of the parts here. I'm, I'm going to try to. Uh, See, this is uh, Alicia Keys, and one of the things that's it's kind of become a cliche, I guess. Uh, here we go here. Um, yeah, you all know her song, so I'm still not there. And so on. Um, one of the things that didn't operate uh, during Katrina there was the fact that in, uh, the hate relief was in uh, uh, social media. Uh, and uh, mobile phone payments and that kind of thing. So people could actually, it was very easy to give, there it says, donation will be added to your mobile phone bill and so on. So in Virginia, you had the, the World Wide Web uh, during uh, uh, the Haitian earthquake. You had uh, uh, Facebook, you had Twitter, uh, you had mo mobile devices and so on. So, anyway, so there you go. Here's just one example of uh, the kind of immediate response by the U.S. Congress and the President um, following um, following the earthquake. And this, this is some of the aid figures. And this is actually very specific. Uh, I think the the amount that's been pledged to Haiti total is about nine billion dollars. All right. And this is a list from. Uh, Relief web, uh, which goes on and on and on. It goes down to, I mean, South Africa and all kinds of much smaller countries. But these are the top countries: U.S., Sweden. And what's interesting is uh, percentage per citizen. Uh, 
And uh, you can see that the UK and the US are pretty much neck and neck, but Sweden, much smaller country, uh, you know, committed almost uh, one fourth as much as the uh, as US. Matter of fact, a number of the Scandinavian countries see themselves as they, they value themselves based on how much aid they provide, uh, not only in cases of emergency, but in terms of normal for normal for aid. Um, but you can see Canada's up there as well. get into the kind of theoretical piece here, if I, if I may. And basically, um, one of the uh, uh, things, the points I want to make, I mentioned political economy before. Uh, when you look both at uh, uh, New Orleans and the Gulf Coast, uh, following Katrina, but even before Katrina, um, as, well as, as well as Haiti, um, one of the things that is operating is a uh, neoliberal kind of a political the uh, economy. And uh, basically, the, um, uh, what I'm doing in terms of the theoretical premise is that uh, an international neoliberal governance framework buttressed by the United States affects the life chances of Haiti, Haitians recovering from the January 12th earthquake, reinforcing existing racial, class, and gender inequalities. Uh, this framework plays out in narratives in the media coverage of the catastrophe. The counter narratives of self help and self determination voiced by Haitians tend not to show up or you know, tend not to show up in the mainstream media accounts, but play a vital role in the national recovery. And so that's kind of a main point that I want to uh, want to underscore early on and I'll get to some of those narratives uh, a little bit later. Um, and I'm going to skip over uh, some of the people that uh, are involved in, in some of this thinking. Uh, but let me just go on and uh, suggest that some of the researchers uh, say that there is a demonstrable nexus between racial inequality and state and local government that rests on the, this is now the train side, that rests on the assumption that the quote, chief end of public power is to equip private market interest with, with the means to allocate most vital goods and services, jobs, health care, housing, and, and so on of society. Further, they state that po uh, the policies that work against human development among the black and poor people of the Gulf Coast grows out of a political economy supported by a neoliberal uh, ideology of, quote, devolution and privatization, unquote, that unravels a social safety net uh, at the same time that it swells poverty and exacerbates racial divisions. Uh, Lowenshaw Lowen argue that racialized neoliberal political economy, and, uh, the, argue that a racialized neoliberal political economy operates in Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi to influence opportunity structures for redevelopment and community agency. In developing their claim, uh, their, their claim that neo, uh, neoliberalism undercuts the goals of human development, Lowe and Shaw um, borrow the concepts of, quote, racial regime, unquote, and, quote, racial order, unquote, from race theorists such as King and Smith. And I have gone to all that in the interest of time. Um, so insofar as I'm using their work for my uh, my own conceptual purposes, I don't want to divide or, or dive too far into the details of uh, the qualitative case studies that go in uh, state form. However, some of you may wonder whether the conceptual framework developed uh, to understand uh, racial order in America and South, where African Americans are in a numerical majority in many cases, or, or pretty much a, a majority in certain counties or cities, such as New Orleans or the Alabama Black Belt, can apply to Haiti was overwhelmingly black population and black government. I would argue that a similar pattern of governance of the uh, recovery, such as it is, uh, has emerged in Haiti. And again, this existed before the before the earthquake. So when I say emerged, it's, 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 I argue that we should kind of pay more attention to it if we want to understand why this uh, recovery is going to be uh, challenged. Um, the, Obviously, this, this, this particular case of Haiti, uh, the uh, governance issues are internationalized. Um, but in most of the ways, the neoliberal structure and ideology has been imposed on the post-earthquake reconstruction of Haiti. Furthermore, the history of Haiti has been characterized by the country's subjugation to the international racial regime, first by the resistance of slaveholding nations, France and the United States, to confer diplomatic recognition on the free black republic. 
been by direct occupation by the United States from 1915 to 1934. This period was characterized by the prevalence of de jure segregation in the U.S. South and de facto racial separation in much of the rest of the, uh, the U.S. Um, so I argue that uh, this racial legacy uh, continues to hover over the halting reconstruction and redevelopment efforts uh, that the dust clouds that, uh, that blanketed Port-au-Prince and Port-au-Prince the minutes and hours after the terrible shaking took place, uh, that took hundreds of thousands of miles and millions of the survivors physically and psychologically. All right, um, so what I want to do is is uh, talk a little bit about a concept that some of you may have heard of, disaster capitalism, um, and of course the shock doctrine that the only client, who's really a journalist, uh, talks about. But I'm going to uh, bring uh, Alex Dupuy uh, to uh, enter our discussion here. And he wrote last summer in the NACLA uh, report on the Americas, uh, he outlined the dilemma facing those charged with rebuilding Haiti, whether to respond to the interests of foreign capital and the Haitian business class, or to prioritize the interests of the impoverished majority, particularly by grassroots and popular organizations. So as the beneficiaries of neoliberal policies began to mobilize under the banner of disaster capitalism, uh, and I should probably say, I, I explain in case some people don't know what disaster capitalism is, it's, a, it's the notion that um, uh, in, in, within neoliberal uh, uh, political economic framework, that uh, you can kind of suspend uh, the uh, uh, protections on, on uh, worker safety, uh, health, environment, and so on, uh, in order to take care of this disaster. But the disaster is basically used uh, as, as an excuse to further uh, privatize and, and to get rid of, uh, uh, of restrictions uh, on an untrammeled capitalism. So uh, we saw this happen in New Orleans. One of the first things that uh, George Bush tried to do, or he actually did do, uh, was to suspend the Bacon Davis Act, which puts a floor under wages uh, for people working in construction. So the idea was, well, we can get rid of some of this paperwork, and uh, we get people in here, and they can start working right away. So um, eventually, uh, there was never an outcry, so he had, he had to reinstate the Davis Bacon uh, Davis Bacon Act. But um, the same kind of things that you saw happening in uh, Iraq uh, with um, uh, uh, some of the companies like uh, Brown, Keller Brown and Root and uh, Halliburton and so on, basically taking over a lot of the services for the, uh, the military. As a matter of fact, I was talking to my father, I just, just in uh, Baton Rouge, where he was now, uh, and he moved away after Katrina. Um, and uh, of course, he says, well, all the things that used to take place in the Army, uh, as lowly things as uh, KP, uh, kitchen control, where uh, you would be uh, punished and you'd have to peel potatoes and that kind of thing. Uh, all that work is being done by outside contractors now, and people are making a bundle of money. So uh, disaster capitalism is just a way to accelerate this privatization <laughs> process and use uh, the, the cover story of the recovery, reconstruction, relief, and so on. Uh, to, to do that. So I'm, I'm arguing that uh, this kind of thing, and I'm not the only one uh, arguing this, uh, is happening in, in Haiti, and it's also happening with the very, or many of the very organizations that are there to help uh, the uh, international uh, relief agencies that may be part of governments, and also some of the non governmental organizations. So I kind of pretty much spell that out. But um, anyway, so let me just... And, and the university, anybody, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has uh, been invited to this uh, UC Haiti uh, event next week. I think it's next Wednesday. Uh, but someone put you know put my name forward on that. And I, when I kind of looked at what they wanted to do, I contacted uh, some people I know who do a lot of work in, in Haiti. We've been going to Haiti for years. and said, well, okay, what's your reaction? And you know some of the names that are mentioned here. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and go, but uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. And, and again, the impulse, I mean, even the impulse for agencies uh, and uh, non government organizations is a positive impulse. I don't, I don't, I don't doubt motives, but the, uh, there, there's also an institutional consequence uh, for this kind of thing. And uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to kind of jump ahead and, and basically, uh, I'll just do this uh, right rather than I'll just talk about it verbally. 
Um, Bill Clinton, who is now known, by the way, as the president of Haiti, the rest of you know that. He went from being the first black president here to being the president of Haiti. And I'm not sure what, where, where he's going next. Well, exactly, right? Well, you know. But remember that he and, he and Hillary actually honeymooned in Haiti. So, so this is kind of full circle. I think, you know, after you retire, you know, you want to get back to those, those kind of, have those nostalgic kind of uh, uh, feeling. But anyway, so he and the, um, uh, the prime minister of Haiti, um, Bell Reed, are the two co-chairs of this uh, international uh, commission for the reconstruction of Haiti. And Bill Clinton actually admitted that one of the policies that he championed when he was president, um, which, and of course, you know, the big thing he did, which President Bush is NAFTA and other kinds of uh, trade liberalization uh, moves that uh, have pretty much destroyed economies all around the world, and like, certainly in this hemisphere. Yes. And Haiti, Haiti didn't escape that. And uh, what he did, and he had his rice farmers in, in Arkansas that are benefiting from, uh, from these policies, they are able to, uh, in, in essence, dump rice in, into Haiti. And they're, of course, Haitian rice, rice farmers uh, who, are, who are basically put out of business. And to the extent that they weren't completely put out of business before the earthquake, what's happened since the earthquake is that they are uh, they're now bringing rice in to feed people that, of course, uh, you know, are facing uh, starvation. Instead of going to the Haitian rice farmers and getting rice from them, they're getting it from the United States. And you see this not only with rice, but with other kinds of products and other kinds of services. Instead of getting them from local providers, these NGOs, uh, agencies, and so on, are uh, connected with, you know, with business interest in their home countries mm -hmm. and they require that the products that are being used in the in, in whatever kind of aid uh, come from those countries. And uh, a number of people are now commenting on this from any from those countries as well. And Canada is another one by the way. On that. And Bell Reeve uh, said that the, the Clinton admitted this in front of uh, the, the US Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee in March. And uh, Bell Reef had to go in front of the Haitian Senate and basically explain that their Haitian sovereignty was going to be uh, subsumed by uh, this IHRC, this, uh, this, this reconstruction uh, commission. And basically, he had said earlier, the Haitian parliament has, you know, does not is not meeting it's, it's suspended and so on. And uh, and of course, they questioned him and said, you're basically, you know, saying that we don't have any control over our fate. He said, well. Basically, you've got to do this in the short run, and you'll, you'll have it have it back uh, down the road. Now, it's questionable whether they have had it even Ever. before. Yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, since the, you know, the, the, the little while that they got to enjoy the revolution uh, before they had to uh, be forced to pay uh, $22 billion in today's money uh, back, to, uh, back to France and revolutions and so on down the line. So anyway, um, some of you may have, may, have seen the, uh, may have seen the 60 Minutes piece on the 14th of January, and they, uh, you, you saw Hayden, Hayden Clinton, that's interesting, Clinton. <laughs> <laughs> Hayden Clinton, uh, but, but Clinton and Bill Reed were featured in that, and I actually have that, but I, I think I'm going to use I'm not going to show that to you there. I'm going to go on to the, to the, to the narrative piece. Um, yes? Excuse me, just a quick question. It's probably sure. common knowledge, but mm -hmm. to whom does Clinton report? Ah, mm -hmm. that's that's very interesting. That is the problem mm -hmm. with this commission. It doesn't. It's not accountable. It doesn't report to anyone. It doesn't have to issue reports on any kind of regular basis. That's a very good question. So they basically are autonomous and pretty much you know decide what they're going to do. Um, basically, to be on that commission, you have to have pledged a certain amount of money, a certain amount of money. And so this is basically a group of donors, and so they decide what's going to happen not in any Haitian government organization or the Haitian people or Haitian community groups and so on. So that's basically my my So they have more power than the government. I mean, yeah. they they have have they, right. Right. There's, there's no there's no government. As a matter of fact, a huge percentage of thirty percent of the civil servants were killed in the earthquake. So you really don't have people to do the daily work of the government as opposed to the you know, political uh, yeah. The commission is so. probably connected to some to what international interests too. Well, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Council of Foreign Relations, groups yeah. like that? You know, Council, oh, yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah. It ties into those kind of things. It ties into the mm -hmm. UN and so on. But, yeah. but when you really get down to it, there is no mm -hmm. requirement that they sure, sure. that they say, okay, this is what we've done. This is, you know, 
do you approve this or would you yeah. like to have a say in this? So there's no sovereignty as far as, as far as he is concerned. Yeah, they're, 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 they're basically. And Bill Reeve actually, the Prime Minister has more power in the Haitian system than the President. He has much more, Bill Reeve has much more power than that. the outgoing President Kavala, if he ever is, you know, replaced by uh, uh, whoever is elected or the need to, uh, uh, to go into the uh, runoff election. So at any rate, um, Having said that, let me let me let me go ahead and uh, move ahead because uh, I kind of indulge a lot of other things. Uh, so what I want to finally kind of uh, get to here is that uh, other piece, which is uh, the uh, idea of narratives. And um, so there are a number of uh, you know my the title of this uh, had to do with uh, humanitarian uh, narratives of humanitarian aid, um, as well as uh, self help and self determination. So, uh, you know, we, we're, I think most of us here are familiar with the notion of grand, grand narratives uh, from uh, Leotard of master narratives and so on. And you could argue that there have been a number of narratives associated with, with Haiti. And uh, they have to do with, I, I argue, with different periods. And of course, the, the first narrative started with the revolution and the fact that uh, the Haitians were able to get their freedom from slavery and become an independent republic that happened. And um, uh, that, of course, was uh, shattering because, uh, one, the Haitians defeated uh, Napoleon, who had the most powerful <laughs> army in the world at that time. All of Europe was afraid of Napoleon. Mm -hmm. And uh, Napoleon even said that, uh, you know, he, he, he needed to uh, win this war uh, because uh, he wanted to stop the forward progress of the black people. Mm -hmm. so, so again, if you need to, if you need to get the racial, racial uh, impetus uh, statement more clearly. I don't think he did more clearly than that. Mm -hmm. But he was, he was defeated uh, uh, after, and as a matter of fact, the Haitians also uh, defeated uh, the British. British came in on that too, mm -hmm. as well. So uh, they, this is one of the, within Haiti, their sort of freedom is, is, is a source <coughs> of a great deal of pride um, and honor. But that's not something that translates out into the narratives that we like to celebrate, like our, like our own American Revolution. We, you know, of course, the Tea Party people want to talk about liberty and uh, independence and you know, Second Amendment uh, 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 remedies and all that kind of thing. Uh, well, the Haitians took matters into their own hands and they took care of that, but they, they proceeded to be punished. So, so the, the, the grand narrative was uh, we can't recognize Haiti diplomatically, we're going to put an embargo around it economically. And uh, they basically were, were, were isolated uh, pretty much for the uh, entire 19th century. Uh, the U.S. didn't really recognize them, even after France did, uh, until uh, you know, we had a civil war. It was kind of hard to begin with. There's some, you know, some uh, conflicts here when we, uh, we continue to uh, uh, champion uh, slavery uh, while you're getting rid of slavery. So the union was. Um, and then I argue that there's another narrative that starts basically in the, uh, the 20th century. Um, and you had, uh, so he went from basically being a country that was isolated, tremendously isolated in the world and feared and despised, and basically a pariah. Uh, not that it was less feared, well, it was less despised in the 20th century, but as other interests started to, to get involved in, in Haiti, uh, such as Germany, uh, uh, which I think it might and I studied Haitian history until I found this out. And uh, so they were involved in the early part of the uh, 20th century, uh, so much so that when uh, the war clouds started to gather uh, for what was to be the first world war, uh, the United States began to be a little concerned about this German presence so close to uh, our borders, and they uh, basically sent in the Marines in uh, 1915 uh, to kind of neutralize that uh, potential German threat. And, uh, Anyway, so I'm arguing that, so Haiti went from being ignored and despised to all of a sudden everybody wanted to have a, a, a finger or a foot in, in, uh, uh, in Haiti. And of course, the United States the closest uh, nation that uh, they were there with first with the most and occupied uh, Haiti until uh, 1934. Um, then you could argue that another narrative uh, developed uh, about Haiti uh, once the uh, Cuban Revolution uh, occurred, and so the, the, the Cold War uh, brought another kind of a, a framework uh, into play here. And you, you basically had uh, 
Haiti being a, one of the real strong anti-communist bulwarks against Castro's Cuba. And it didn't matter that, uh, that uh, Papa Doc, uh, Francois Duvalier, uh, was uh, a dictator, a tyrant, a uh, person that, that had a, a secret police force, um, was corrupt and, and so on, but he was our corrupt dictator. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of been the line that the U.S. uses uh, uh, during, the, during the Cold War. You know? He's our bastard, he's our winner. So, uh, so you had that operating um, uh, pretty much up to, uh, you know, obviously, both father and son's uh, regime ended in 19, 1986 with the son, 1970, the father, uh, Papa Doc, Baby Doc. Uh, but of course, as many of you know, Baby Doc has returned. Um, and we, we'll, we can say that for the uh, question and answer uh, period. But anyway, uh, so we, we're now at this, this, this new narrative, which is, uh, I argue that uh, this kind of master narrative, which is, well, Haiti is is miserable. Haiti is poor. Life is grim there, uh, and then you die. Um, and uh, we, but we need to do something because there are children who are suffering and so on. So we're gonna we're gonna uh, try to uh, try to uh, help Haiti. And uh, there are all kinds of proposals, including some uh, like uh, Leslie Voltaire, uh, who's a political figure in Haiti. Uh, say let's let's move people out of uh, densely populated and dangerous port prince and get them out into rural areas and we can set up smaller communities and so on. And that's that's the ring the bell say, hmm, I think I heard that before. They were saying the same thing about the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans. Yeah. So again you have this kind of uh, this kind of interest in massive kind of uh, movements of people, even though the people have been uh, in the case of Haiti been in displaced uh, persons camps. Uh, nobody worried about that movement and worried about them, you know, lingering and, and uh, you know, suffering out there in those in those camps. Uh, and the same thing in New Orleans. Uh, people weren't going to be allowed to, to rebuild in the Lower Ninth Ward. Of course, the again self determination and uh, people's uh, uh, community uh, agency uh, kept that from uh, kept that from happening. So I'm basically arguing that there is a counter narrative, and I'm not going to show you. The, there's a video I wanted, wanted to show. Um, I was trying to wrap it up. Um, a counter narrative of Haitians operating on the ground who are saying, "No, we do not. You know, you're not going to dictate to us, or you're not going to even suggest what might be best for us. We want to cover some of the uh, uh, some of these issues ourselves, and uh, many of these issues. One of the and it, it was the video would show if I were going to show part of it. Uh, it's um, about. Oh, it's basically done by uh, a grassroots uh, media organization uh, in Haiti and it's staffed by, uh, by Haitians. And basically a news story on uh, what's called um, uh, money for food. Uh, cash for work, I'm sorry. Yeah, but it, it ends up being obviously food. And the idea here is that you pay people uh, some money uh, to, get, to get money in their pockets and they feel good about themselves and so on. And it kind of sounds in principle like a good idea because they're actually working. It'd be one thing if you were skimming money because that'd be too much like welfare. You can't do that. But you've got this, so it's kind of like workfare. And basically what happens is that uh, in, this, in the story you will see some people making their first statement how this is a good thing. And what, what really is a good thing is not only because it puts money in the pockets of the workers, but uh, in this you know, kind of a global strong environment that you find yourselves in, but it keeps them pacified. Them. The Haitians are, uh, and I'm not, I'm not making a you know, statement about the national character, but I think, uh, and I'm making more of a statement about our national character. We've had things done to us in this country where we should be out on the barricades, we should be rioting uh, when, when <coughs> rights are taken away or programs are, are taken away. They, like the students in, uh, in England, you know, when they were forced to uh, uh, look at much higher uh, tuition, but their you know, education was almost free. Um, so we don't have that kind of uh, willingness anymore to get out there and protest in, in most cases. I mean, you have these kind of mock things and you know, Tea Party people come out with their lawn chairs and <laughs> sit around and uh, watch them, you know, mm -hmm. the reflecting pool and all that. Uh, and Glenn Beck serenades them and shows that he's right. Kind of but um, the, the uh, uh, Haitians are quick. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think there were some supplies that were coming in, or some clothing, or whatever. And they looked at it and said, "This is secondhand stuff. This is not. This, this food is not good. 
and they basically protested it. So there is a, a there's a quick willingness to respond to uh, <clears throat> perceived affronts and and perceived injustice and so on, which I think is more more often than not a, a good thing as opposed to a bad or, or, or too quick to get upset or that kind of thing. I'm not, I'm not trying to characterize it that way at all. Uh, they're looking out for for themselves and for their rights and for their, their communities. So. Um, Anyway, so they basically interview a, a couple of economists, and the truth comes out about the cash for work that uh, it's not enough money to make any difference, basically. Uh, no, it doesn't create a multiplier effect where other kinds of businesses are being stimulated, other kinds of services are being, uh, being created, and so on. But it's basically a way just to pacify, uh, pacify uh, the, the Haitians uh, during this time when they're going to be uh, kind of stretched uh, emotionally. So, um, having having said that, my uh, last slide. The grand narratives that are imposed on, uh, on people uh, where, where the country or region or area uh, might be uh, are uh, things that have to be counteracted. And uh, when, in the case of Haiti, uh, we don't necessarily hear the voices of, of, uh, of Haitians. Uh, we often are, you know, the, the voices that we do hear are the voices of people that speak English, for example, or they're the same contacts that people like parachuting is the word that's used uh, interview. So you don't necessarily get to hear uh, what people and what uh, people who represent communities uh, uh, say and think and or propose it themselves. So so with that I'm gonna stop and we have a maybe a couple minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. about the narratives and the counter-narratives, I was wondering how do you add the Dominican Republic as a factor in this complexity? Okay. In what's in back in the historical era, you mean right now? The narratives that are currently circulating. Right. Uh, that's, that's a good question. Uh, the Dominican Republic and hey, there's people make a lot of the tensions and differences between, between the countries and they also accentuate the fact that uh, Haiti has it's been environmentally ravaged because of the poverty that people have basically deforested in Haiti. You can fly from the Dominican Republic <coughs> to Haiti, and as you hit the border, you literally know what the border is because the trees stop. Oh, you know, there's wow. literally, and at that refugee camp I told you about, uh, there are no trees. There's not, you can't see a tree. You can't even see a bush you know, for as far as the eye, the eye goes. Um, specifically, I had not really thought about this, but specifically, uh, Dominicans were there to provide aid very early on. There's a lot of uh, cross-border activity uh, that goes on. There's another uh, colleague who was in history here who does work in that border region. Um, she, deal, she deals with demonic animals and kind of uh, at least related to uh, um, So I would, I would, I don't know if there's a big narrative that you could uh, that you could point to right now, but I think on a, on a micro level, I think uh, there's a there's a, uh, a sense of identification. Uh, with with Haitians in this particular crisis. If you go back to, uh, again, to the 1930s, there was a huge massacre of Haitian workers in the Dominican Republic. Mm -hmm. So so there's that there's that history. So when you, when you bring it up, I have to kind of think about it and kind of bring it into some, you know, a, a specific uh, time frame or something. But that's a good question. I'll, I'll think about it and see if something else will come up there. Yes, Scott. Yeah, I, I was curious. Of course, there's an obvious irony of you know, baby doc being in the Aristide being in exile. Right. You know, I was going to bring it up. Thank you. <laughs> that's just, that's, yeah. uh, that, that, that just picture with Terry hair. Yeah. 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 So I'm just wondering, uh, given the way that Aristide was deposed, Aristide's politics, um, has the um, earthquake, the disaster, and, and kind of search for some kind of grassroots politics that addresses these questions of inequality 
uh, how is it related to the vacuum, uh, the political vacuum, mm -hmm. of um, sending Harris to exile? So as um, about us, the political party kind of reconstituted itself. Um, mm -hmm. I just wondering how you kind of gauge right. mm -hmm. those kind of politics mm -hmm. Right, I'm not, I'm not an expert. As a matter of fact, I've tried to talk, you know, and it will take a while to get back to you, but I, I you know sometimes for me, if, if that's what there are, some people are going back and forth that I know, but I'm more into the political uh, realm. As a matter of fact, one, uh, I can't think what you would call her, but she actually, when she was in school, she never finished Harvard. She was in I said, what do you major? She said, well, economics, not very She was an Aristide supporter. And so she was staying at the same place that I was staying. Uh, for, you know, we overlapped by about three or four days or something like that. She had <coughs> several Aristide uh, folks come over and that kind of thing. Um, here's what the Haitian government said with the government of Haiti. They're all these average GOH government of Haiti. Okay. <laughs> so some spokesman said, uh, I don't care how many passports Aristide gets, we're not living back in the country. Wow. They're just not, it's, wow. and this is because of the U.S. This is the U.S. It's yeah. not even internal. It's, Mm -hmm. So I don't, it, and you talk about vacuum power, I think the, the U.S. created vacuum, mm -hmm. of course, Clinton right. got dirty hand yeah. on this one, too. Exactly. So, okay. so I, I, you know, I, and I sit there and look at, you know, uh, uh, Baby Dog parading around, mm -hmm. and, uh, and and he might get prosecuted, but maybe not, but there are young people who weren't alive when right. he was in power, and right. they're saying, oh, I like him, you know. Mm -hmm. So there's this, you know, you got yeah. the same problem, you know, Haitians usually have a fairly good sense of, of history. I think, you know, like everything else in the last generation or so, you know, there's, no, there's not that much education out there, yeah. there's, much, much, uh, there's necessarily uh, that, that kind of uh, awareness of what this might mean. I mean, I think this is, our Steve did nothing compared to uh, Duvalier, and I'm sorry, you know, so, you know, whatever you, whatever stories you want to make up about him, but he right. was, he was duly elected, he was a popular sure. candidate, and he was a candidate of the people, so mm -hmm. uh, if there's something wrong with that, then maybe we need to kind of go back and uh, we look at our own government and who's mm -hmm. in, who's in, and how they got there, and that kind of thing. And yeah. How the previous, the previous president. So I don't have any specific insights, yeah. but I do think that's the biggest irony that he gets to come back to the country, and uh, and the guy that uh, that represents the people, the poor people, mm -hmm. you know, the majority of the people, uh, can't get can't get close to the yeah. country even in these times. You know, even mm -hmm. these times. So it's pretty awful. Yeah. I, I, I certainly like the way you frame a bigger master narrative that links all the sub narratives together, and that and, and that begins with the Haitian Revolution, mm -hmm. uh, where a a sort of European-controlled country is taken over by a bunch of black savages mm -hmm. who are so low down uh, in the hierarchy of humankind right. mm -hmm. that they can, cannot be trusted to run a country. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. and therefore our approach is to isolate them mm -hmm. uh, and make them pariahs. Mm -hmm. Then by 1915, we have been into Haiti so many, into Haiti so many times since 1950. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, it's like you, have, you must have occupiers' quarters. And so we come, we come full circle to the last crisis in Haiti. And what can we, you know, we can't trust a bunch of black savages to, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, run their country what we have to do is take it over. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's 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 yeah. it's yeah. completely yeah. consistent yeah. With, with with, with uh, and completely with complete continuity from the earlier period to this yeah. period. I, I I never thought of that until I, I, some people maybe may remember when we had um, here in the center uh, one of um, the recent presidents of Haiti. Um, um, Money. Oh, yes. uh, yeah, 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 mm -hmm. yeah. But at any rate, when he told this story, it was the first time here that you could really see this. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, it's an unbelievable pattern of international relations, mm -hmm. and you can't understand it apart from the racial dimension. Right. 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 The neoliberal, the neoliberal politics or political economy is, is completely. <clears throat> tied up with, with that, that racial animus, really. Yeah. That's what it is. That's what it is. Yeah. Quite yeah. This is a brand new topic for me, and I'm an urban planning mm -hmm. student. 
and it just seems I'm very new in my studies that there are a lot of similarities with this neoliberal economics and politics. And I, like I said, I don't know Haiti at all in the history of Haiti or the political history, but I'm looking at some of the similarities with how East African countries in particular are treated where you know, we've had some political influence, but our influence politically is not so strong. So if you take that neoliberal economic approach in terms of not necessarily dealing with disasters, but in dealing with poverty and poverty mm -hmm. reduction and the kinds of plans that we try to affect and put into place that, that, that don't have good results and how Kenyans, you know, are almost tired of our empty promises, mm -hmm. not just the United States, but other countries that do have more of their fingers in, in the aid pot, and there just seems to be this this horrible influence of neoliberal, uh, like, economics. Mm -hmm. You know, if we can't yes. feed them, let's give them soda. Right, mm -hmm. right, exactly. And if nothing else, we'll, we'll keep our own, our own economic interests happy. It just seems like, what are we going to learn? Right. We do a better job. Right. Well, I don't I don't think we want to learn. I think that's what we want to make. They're doing this. This is intentional. Yeah, exactly. 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 And then you need the political combination just. Well, it's interesting. I, and I, I had not actually met this person. I talked about it on the phone. I, was, I knew I was going to Haiti. But I um, called uh, my the sister of this particular person who works where I teach at Cal Lutheran. Uh, anyway, she's been to Haiti a couple of times, and she said she's been to Africa. She says Haiti reminds me a lot of Africa, very, very African feeling. I would agree with that. It's an Eastern Cuba, similar kind of thing. But uh, mm. so I would argue, I guess that yeah, the same kind of things that go on in Africa, the, you know, kind of the impunity in which the U.S. You don't listen to people's right, voices. Don't, yeah, you don't right, don't, get don't, their don't, input. Don't because you don't consider them to be right. an equal level to exactly. you. you know? and it's, and it's, it's, it's sad because, you know, we're 20, what, 2011, and uh, you know, people still operate as kind of preliminary productivity and kind of bring action. You know? But that's, you, have to, you have to acknowledge that otherwise you're not going to understand why these policies exist. You know? That's what I'm trying to argue. Mm -hmm. Call it a statement more strongly than the yeah. idea. As a matter of fact, the, uh, the guy that was the main tenant that was kind of subletting from when I was there uh, is a Belgian guy. He's white Belgian, but he's, he works for a Haitian NGO. And uh, um, one of the things I did is I brought him a couple of books. And one of them was uh, looking at uh, you know, basic political economy and et cetera. So, so again, so trying to, he's interested in understanding uh, Haiti as a failed state. And so he, he wants to uh, get some books that, uh, so, so I think there's another event. Um, I don't know if anyone else has any other questions. We've got an unveiling of something happening. Yeah. 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 The African American role in this story, mm -hmm. uh, from the obvious uh, our our president mm -hmm. and uh, to other uh, other uh, organizations and groups that might have interest in our uh, relationship with uh, Caribbean. And that's something I want to actually do on a system a systematic basis. Um, yeah. And see, you know, for example, Trans Africa would be uh, right. place. Mm -hmm. But going to sort of present, I'm disappointed here, dis dis disappointed with his policy position on uh, New Orleans Fall of Katrina. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. He, uh, in terms of New Orleans uh, housing, okay. his housing secretary is, is subscribes to this theory where you just you 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 get people get poor people out of the housing products because you don't want to have them all clustered together because it's concentrated poverty. And if you do that, they won't have good life chances. Mm -hmm. However, there was no uh, solution in terms of having a place for other people that were kicked out of the housing problems in New Orleans to go to. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. The, so now you've got homelessness increasing, mushrooming there, mm -hmm. and the price of housing. There's no there's no more affordable housing in New Orleans. Yeah. You still have a place that's OK for 300 a month. Now those places are going for close to 1,000. Yeah. Uh, Simply so, so, so kind of thing, and, and he, one of the first things that that Obama said, you know, a few months out after the earthquake was, 
uh, fairly recently is that the deportations of Haitians from the United States are going to start again. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm really not giving him a lot of a lot of credit. He said a couple of good things right away, but but he also told Haitians don't don't think about coming here in great numbers. That's the first thing he said, and then, then of course that's time by he, he, he uh, popped up with that other statement. Mm -hmm. So there's this there's this kind of almost blind following of previous administration's policies, which I'm very disappointed with, and, mm -hmm. I, and I don't know if it's, you know, there is, I don't think there's a, what, a hate, hate lobby, mm -hmm. okay, at, at all. I mean, Maxine Waters is a champion, so I, I see right. people like her, so I, there's some things happening at the uh, Congressional Black Caucus level that, that may make a difference, but uh, right, here, right now, of course, everybody's kind of, you know, shuddering from the last election, you know, right. so, uh, so we're kind of on the defensive there. Okay. But it's, it's in part, you know, really been reactionary too. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, you know, from the period of the Cuban Revolution to the present, Haitians have been uh, classified as economic refugees, mm -hmm. therefore you are not welcome. Right. Yeah. Uh, whereas Cubans are political right. refugees, yeah. and therefore you yeah. are welcome. Right. Uh, and come, come one, come all. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the the black population of Miami, mm -hmm. which was poor in the first place, mm -hmm. has been put in economic competition mm -hmm. right. with the immigrant right. Haitians. So you've got, you know, you know, they've become a bit of a reactionary force. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the uh, entities like TransAfrica mm -hmm. uh, and a few members of the Black Caucus who are very progressive really have not made, made much progress on this issue over a long period of time. I mean, just, you know, fighting that whole distinction between right. economic and political, right. it's right. a very, it's, it's really, right. we let but whites you, in, we keep right. the blacks out, that's right. what's out. Right, but you, you might have thought that this was, this current crisis was a, a opportunity to expand that circle, educate folks, maybe right. bring other groups into that fold, but I guess uh, not so much. In, uh, Unfortunately. Well, I think we should uh, thank Russell. Uh,